Today, if you want to take your Bibles and open up to the book of Philippians, uh, we're going to be in chapter 3, verses 12, through the uh, first verse of chapter 1 today. Um, I kind of alluded to this a couple of times in uh, Bible class this morning, but I, I wanted to talk about this passage because um, when, we're, when we're thinking about the gospel and we're thinking about our faithfulness in the gospel, we've been talking about, uh, we're going to be picking back up in the Exodus here real soon. We've been talking about the book of Hebrews. Um, I, I've talked about encouragement, rebuilding, and everything else along those lines over the last uh, last several months. Well, actually, over the course of this year. Uh, and, and so, looking at this, uh, looking at this passage, I think kind of kind of blends a lot of those things together. And, and this is a passage that has really been kind of on my mind. Uh, for the last several weeks, and, and I have a really great illustration that I like to use for this passage, and, and, and sometimes, you know, you just have a great illustration, you build a sermon around it, right? Uh, and so that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of where my mind was at, but, but when we think about uh, Ephesians, uh, or not Ephesians, but Philippians, when we think about the book of Philippians, we have to understand the context of the book, right? So there are a lot of things going on here, uh, and, and we're just going to talk about a couple of them to kind of lend to the context of Philippians chapter 3, verses, uh, verse 12 through 4, 1, because context is supremely important. The three keys to understanding the Bible are context, context, and context. So we've got the context of the book, we've got the context of the setting, and we've got the context of the Bible. And so understanding the context of the book and the setting of Philippians really helps lend to our understanding of what exactly is going on here. So the first thing that we need to understand is that Paul was writing this letter from prison. He had been uh, taken prisoner, he had been sent to Rome, he was sitting in prison, he was waiting on uh, a trial in front of uh, Caesar. Remember, he had appealed to Caesar uh, when he thought he was going to get an unfair trial there in, uh, in Jerusalem, and so they shipped him off to Rome. Uh, he was in prison, he'd been there for a while, he was under house arrest. Um, he had uh, talked to a lot of the people in the, uh, in, uh, the Praetorian Guard. He had converted a few of the people. Uh, the church at Philippi had sent him some money to help him along. They had sent him a fellow by the name of Epaphroditus to come and help. Um, Epaphroditus was there. He was helping Paul. He got sick. Paul wanted to send him home. There were a lot of things were going on when we think about uh, the book of Philippians. Uh, we also see that he wanted to encourage the Christians at Philippi in the work of the gospel. Now, uh, Philippians is oftentimes called Paul's love letter to the church at Philippi uh, because this was a letter that was filled with joy and encouragement. There were only a couple of small issues that he wanted to encourage them on, uh, in particular the, the uh, ongoing feud between Yoda and Syntyche was one of the big problems, or one of the few problems that he was needing to address. And he was concerned that the problems there were going to pull them away from serving uh, the gospel and, and serving their faith and aiming toward the righteousness of the kingdom of heaven. And so he wanted to encourage them to help these ladies settle their problems and to get back to the work. You know, if you look at Romans or you look at 1 Corinthians, you'll see congregations that were nearly paralyzed uh, from the work of the church because of the problems, and Paul didn't want Philippi, the church at Philippi to get there. They weren't really headed that way hard yet, but he wanted to make sure that they continued in the work of the gospel, both collectively as well as individually. And I think here in chapter 3, he really talks about the individual responsibility and how that feeds to the collective responsibility of us moving toward the work in the gospel. And in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, he encourages them to work toward righteousness in Christ. And so this kind of helps pick us up where well, we're going to start talking about this today. But again, the context is supremely important. So after he talks about uh, the righteousness in Christ and sharing in his sufferings and sharing in this righteousness and all of these things, um, he really wants to zero in on that personal responsibility uh, of each and every Christian to, to really press forward toward the gospel of Christ. So uh, pressing toward the gospel of Christ is the ends up being the title of this lesson. So we pick up here with chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this. He's talking about the, the perfection of the righteousness of Christ, right? Um, perfection here means mature as well as flawless. Now, the only way we get to be flawless is through Christ. We can't do it on our own. We can't make, it, make that happen for ourselves. We are reliant, 100% reliant on Christ to be righteous. Okay, So we have to mature and we have to obtain that righteousness through Christ. And so he says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, 
but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. And so Paul really here very, very strongly identifies with the fact that he is a Christian, one who belongs to Christ. Now, if you think about it, Christ has made us his own by a couple of different things. He's made us his own by right of creation. You look at the memory verse we have today, first, uh, Col uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it's all the way through 18, and he talks about, the, Paul talks about there the fact that we are part of God's creation, and it was made for Christ, through Christ, and by Christ, and so he, he owns us by right of creation. We also belong to him. He has also made us one of his own by right of redemption. We have wandered off into sin. We have uh, gone our own way. We have abandoned our place, our proper place, by the side of God. And once we have gone off into sin, we have sold ourselves into slavery to sin, if you will. And God, and God through the work of Christ, has bought us back. He has redeemed us back from that uh, bond service to sin. And so he owns us. We are his own by right of creation as well as by right of redemption. And so Paul is very proud to say that he belongs to Christ. And so he doesn't want anyone to think that he has completed this work, but he wants everyone to know that he is motivated. Now sometimes we know what we need to do, Sometimes we have a plan in what we're going to do, but what is the final key to making those plans come to reality? Motivation. Paul is motivated because Christ has made him his own. And he is motivated to, to make that mean something. He's motivated to make that worthwhile. He's motivated by his love for Christ and his appreciation for that sacrifice. So he continues to move forward toward that righteousness. Verse 13 and 14, he says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Not yet. He's on his way, right? But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Now, this is the passage that I have the illustration for. Okay, some of you have heard this illustration. It's one of my favorite because this is not a preacher story. This actually happened. I was on a mission trip in India, and this has been 20 years ago. And as we were finishing our gospel meeting, and there were several people who wanted to be baptized, so we were on our way to the reservoir to baptize uh, six or seven people. I can't remember how many. And so we're on our way, and we're singing hymns, uh, and everybody else is singing in the local language of Telugu. I'm singing in English, me and a guy Bill that's with me, and we're walking down the street, and I am four to seven inches taller than every other man in the entire village. And I'm, I'm white, okay? And so as I'm walking through this village in India and we're singing these hymns, a guy comes riding b past us on a motorcycle, or bicycle, excuse me. And he looks back at me. And so instead of forgetting what is behind and pressing forward, he never sees the goat. And he runs right into that goat. And the poor old goat goes flying one direction, <laughs> the poor old guy goes flying the other direction. And so the moral of the story is this forget what is behind you, pay attention to what is ahead, and press forward toward your ultimate goal. And the one thing I had to say about that afternoon is good thing that was a goat and not a water buffalo. <laughs> and so Paul here is telling them. Don't look back. Now, sometimes we need to understand where we're coming from. But Paul is telling them here, don't let where you've come from dictate where you're going. Don't let your successes of the past keep you from succeeding in the future. Don't let your failures in the past keep you from moving forward. Don't let the sins that are behind you weigh you down. The Hebrew writer tells us to lay aside those sins which so easily beset you and run the race with endurance. And so Paul here is telling everybody, don't worry about what's behind you. Keep moving forward. Strain to move forward. Press to move forward. Put some effort into it. You see, if we don't put any effort into it, and we don't have that motivation that we need, we're never going to make it. And the goal, the goal that we're trying to reach is the upward call 
of God in Christ Jesus. What are we aiming for? What is your ambition? What is your desire? My desire is to answer this call that God has put out to each and every one of us. All of us have been called, but how many of us are going to answer that call? Paul says we need to continue to press forward. He's, he has, however, worked toward, worked toward moving toward this goal with his entire being. Paul says, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect. I won't be this side of heaven. But I am motivated to move forward because I want to attain, I want to achieve this upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I am motivated to continue moving forward and I'm going to work on, working on, moving forward with every fiber of my being. No matter where I'm at, no matter the circumstances that I find myself in, no matter who may be opposing me, no matter what sin may be trying to beset me, I am going to keep moving forward, no matter what. And again, remember how important the context is of the book of Philippians. Where is Paul? What's he doing? What's he facing? What are the challenges that he's had to deal with? Think about all the, the difficult things that he, has have to, that he has had to endure up to the writing of this letter. And think about the amazing motivation that we still see in him regardless of his circumstances. We continue on verses 15 and 16. He said, Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if, anything, uh, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let's, let us hold true to what we have obtained. Now, this verse is kind of like in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I behaved like a child, but now that I'm a man, I've put aside childish things. He's telling the Corinthians what? Grow up. Start acting like grown-ups. And what's he telling the Philippians here? If you are mature, and you should be, you need to think this way. If you're not thinking like this, then you need to do what? You need to grow up. You need to put aside childish ways and simple thinking, and you need to understand the message of the gospel of Christ. This ties in a bit with the, with the conversation about settling the disagreement between the two ladies in the congregation. This has a lot to do with what we need to have in our hearts and in our lives so that we can continue moving toward the righteousness of Christ. If we keep thinking of simple and childish things, we are never going to grow to maturity. And so okay as a grown up to have fun and to joke and to cut up and to have hobbies and all of those things. But at the end of the day, what do we need to do? We need to grow up. And we need to understand the reality of the world around us, and especially the reality of the spiritual world that is around us. And so if we still have childish thinking, God is going to reveal that. God is going to show us that we need to take that next step to maturity. He's going to point it out, and He's going to allow us to take that as a lesson to learn so we can continue to grow and to move forward toward that maturity, which helps us move toward that righteousness in Christ. In verse 16, he tells us, hold true to what we have attained, attained. Don't look back. He just said that in the previous verses, right? Don't look back. Hang on to the gains that you have made. He tells us here also that understanding the work ahead is more important than we fully realize. We need to know what we're moving toward. This is kind of like what we've been talking about in the book of Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah, before he got there, before he really got to, to know what needed to be done, he had to assess the damage. He had to, he had to look at the city. He had to look at the walls. He had to look at the people. He had to hear from the people what all was going on, the, the bad problems that they were having. But he also had to understand the assets that they had and, and the people that were ready to work. And, and once he got a good understanding of the problem, the work could begin. And we need to do the same thing. We need to gain a good understanding of what's going on around us. But we also need to realize the work that's ahead of us. 
And I'm going to put it bluntly, some of us aren't up for the task. We haven't grown up. We haven't matured. We haven't put aside our childish ways like Paul told the Corinthians. And, and we haven't been made, re been made ready or made ourselves ready to undertake the serious nature of this work that's lying in front of us. And until we do so, we're never going to accomplish this task. And so once we begin thinking and, and acting in that mature and responsible manner, then we can start making that headway. Then we can start gaining that ground and moving toward the righteousness of Christ. That's one reason why it's so important for those of us who are adults, those of us who have matured somewhat in the Spirit, to, to be able to take that opportunity to teach our kids so that they can grow and they can develop in Christ Jesus as well. And so we're always moving ourselves and our children and our congregation toward this righteousness in Christ. Verse 17, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Just as he says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, he tells them, Imitate me even as I also imitate Christ. And so Paul has already said, I've not obtained perfection yet. I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not the right kind of guy yet. I'm not doing everything I should yet, but I'm working toward it. And I want you to imitate me in the fact that I'm working on it. Don't take my lack of perfection. Don't take my lack of, uh, of perfect maturity as, as not being a good example just yet, because at least I'm working on it. And I want you to work on it too. And just like he told the Corinthians, he says, imitate me even as I also imitate Christ Jesus. Paul didn't want the people to follow Paul. Paul wanted the people to follow Paul in following Christ. And so Paul says, look at me. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to stay motivated. I'm trying to work toward the, the example of righteousness in Christ. And you have other people that are great examples for you too. Look to them. This is another reason why it's so important to make sure that we are surrounded by members of the church as often as we can be. Because if our examples come from the world or if our examples come from the media, we are going to fall short every single time. We don't follow perfect examples all the time, but we make sure that they're examples that are pointed in the right direction. And Paul wants people to know that how important that is. And he says, he also points out here, and he points out through the rest of Philippians and in other books, he says that we can draw strength from the good example of our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's so important that we model the right kind of behavior, the right kind of attitude, and the right kind of love for Christ for the people that surround us, especially our kids. And again, another reason why it's so important for us to have Bible class teachers. What does it tell the kids when we're up here the week before we start a new quarter that we're still looking for people to teach them in their class? Just something else to think about there. Gary, I, this should be two different sermons, right? Uh, and so we see that we can draw that strength from those good examples. In verse 18, he says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Why is it so important that we follow the good examples that we have around us? Because there are plenty of bad examples to go around. And, and Paul even points out that some of these people may even be within the church. He, he talked earlier in the book about those who are preaching the gospel to try to make Paul upset. And Paul's like, I don't care if they may try to make me upset or not. If they're preaching the gospel, that's great. But there are some people who are enemies of the cross, who are fighting against God, who are fighting against Christ, who are fighting against the message that Paul is bringing, who, who don't want to hear the gospel and don't want that gospel to be spread. And so they are setting traps for those who would walk in the gospel. They are setting, setting themselves up as enemies of the cross of Christ. And this upsets Paul because he wants all to come to the knowledge of the gospel message and to experience the salvation of of Christ. And we have to be aware of the influence of those who are enemies of Christ. There are plenty of people in the world who would seek to, to shut down the church, who would seek to belittle the gospel, who would seek to uh, 
turn the Bible into mythology or do away with it altogether. There are more subtle people who are maybe even walking amongst us from time to time who would pull us away from the true message of the gospel to a message that serves their own lusts and their own desires or, or profits them individually. There are people who are willing to change the message of the Bible in order to suit the circumstances of their own life or the circumstances of the lives of people that they care about. Rather than holding fast to the truth, they want to pervert the truth to match their own ideas. And we have to beware of that influence because there are plenty of those out there who would do so. He continues on in verse 19. He says, Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with mindsets on earthly things. Now, I've had a lot of people tell me, man, right now in the world, it's the worst it's ever been. Same thing. What did Solomon say? There's nothing new under the sun. It's not worse than it's ever been. It's the same as it's ever been. There are people who would oppose God. And Paul says their end is destruction, separation, eternal separation from all that is good and all that is right and all that is holy in a place that is eternally separated from God. Because their God is not the God of heaven. Their God is their own desires, their own lusts, their, their own belly. Their glory, they, they glory in their shame. Now we're just more aware of that today. Turn on the internet for five minutes. Man. I had a friend of mine ask a question the other day. He said, when did narcissism become a commercial talent? And I said, I would, say, I would say when Facebook started, but I'm old enough to remember the gong show. As funny as that is, it's true, right? Mindsets. Mindset is earthly. They're with minds set on earthly things. Jesus said, friendship with the world is enmity toward God. When our mind is set on earthly things, God is our enemy. But Paul doesn't want to leave it there. Right? Paul doesn't want to, want to end on a note of discouragement for these Christians there in Philippi, so he continues on. After he talks about the idea that trading a desire to obtain the righteousness of Christ for earthly gain leads to destruction. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Man cannot serve God and mammon. He cannot serve two masters. What does Jesus say? He'll love the one and hate the other, cling to one and despise the other. This warning is all throughout the scriptures. And this is such an important warning that if you go to most of the other world religions, they will tell you something almost identical. That's what you call a universal truth. But again, he doesn't want to leave them on a bad note. Instead, he tells us what we're aiming for. Not just the, the righteousness of Christ, but something that's even beyond that. Something that, that's greater and more than we could possibly imagine. He tells them in verse 20, he says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong in a place called heaven. And right now Jesus is there. And eventually, when this day is over, when this time is done, He is going to come back. And He is going to gather us up together with Him, and He is going to take us home. You look at John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and bring you to my own. Look at what he's saying here. Our citizenship. Now, this idea of citizenship here for the Philippians it has, has a lot of importance. More importance than we normally realize. A lot of the people in a lot of the cities in Macedonia and Achaia and Greece and, and everywhere over there, they, were, they had been colonized by the Romans. They were a conquered people. But Philippi, Philippi was a Roman city. It was a Roman city, and most of the people in Philippi were Roman citizens. 
And we know from what the Apostle Paul went through how important and how powerful it was to be a Roman citizen in these places. And when he tells the people in Philippi, hey, I'm a Roman citizen that you beat without permission. That's why they panicked so badly. It's because they knew what that meant. And they knew that their lives were on the line for having done so. And so when Paul tells them, Philippians, your citizenship is not there in Philippi. Your citizenship is not part of the Roman Empire. Your citizenship is in heaven. That was a greater and more powerful thing than you could possibly imagine. Because at the end of the day, when all is said and done, even though we are citizens of this country, our true citizenship lies in heaven. A greater ambition a more powerful ambition than, than being part of any nation on this earth. And so he tells us our citizenship, where we belong, is no longer in this world but in heaven. And our Savior there, our Savior is there making the place ready. We talked about from Hebrews this morning, it's, it's done. Waiting on the time to come and to carry us home. How amazing, how powerful, how important is that? But he continues on talking about Christ in verse 21. He says, Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, that spiritual body that, that returns from the resurrection, by the power that enables e uh, him even to subject all things to himself. Our Savior has the power of life and death. Our Savior has the power to transform us from what we are now to what he wants us to become. Those resurrected creatures, those resurrected beings that have that spiritual body that's no longer subject to sin and to death, that's able to hold on to the glory and to the righteousness of, and the holiness of Christ. And so not only are we going to be moved, relocated from this world into this place called heaven, but we will be transformed from this lowly body into the great spiritual body that Paul also talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Where he also says, if we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most pitiful, most miserable, but we have a greater hope in Christ. And not only do we belong in that place called heaven, but Christ himself, through the power of the gospel, will prepare us to enter in. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready as I stand. It's going to take that divine power of Christ to change me from what I am now to what I need to be to claim that citizenship in that place called heaven. And I have every faith and every confidence in Christ that he can do that. And I will continue to press forward in the call of God, that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Until that day, I have obtained it. And so he says to them in verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm. Anytime you see stand firm, hold fast, Anything like that throughout the Bible, think of the great tree that's planted by the waters. And that tree that has been able to take its roots over its lifetime and sink them deep, deep, deep into the ground. And when the storms come and the winds blow and the floods break loose, kind of like that house that's built on the rock, right? That tree is going to hold fast into that ground. That tree is going to be unmoved by the circumstances and the situations that surround it. It's going to hold fast right where it's at because its foundation, its roots have been sunk deep into the earth. And we're going to be the same way when we have our foundation sunk deep into the roots of the gospel of Christ. We have something that we're moving toward. We're pressing toward the full call of the gospel. And thanks be to God who gives us the opportunity every day to continue to be strengthened so that we can continue moving forward. Therefore, we should be certain to stand firm in the gospel 
and our faith in Christ Jesus. In the Exodus, as we're reading that, Moses records the examples, the, the good, bad examples of those who made it to the border of Canaan and whose heart failed. And we're going to be back on that when we get back into Bible class here on Wednesday nights for, for a little while. And, and they were denied entry into that promised land because of their unbelief. And the Hebrew writer in chapters 3 and 4 warns Christians of today, don't have that same failure, don't have that same fear, don't have that same unbelief that's going to keep you from entering into the promised land, to into that place called heaven. Don't go backwards and leave the faith. And Paul is telling the Philippians, stand firm. You've got a lot going on around you right now. You've got a lot of challenges that may be ahead of you, and you've still got some work to do. But you're rooted in the gospel of Christ right now. Stay there. Continue to sink those roots deep, deep down into the soil. Continue to grow. Continue to spread that word. And hold fast to the promises that your Savior has made to you. And I want to encourage each and every one of us here today to do the same thing. Hold fast to the promises of your Savior. He promised that if you hear His word, and if you believe in His Son as the Son of the living God, the Christ, and you are ready and willing to repent of your sin, and you are ready and willing to confess Christ's name before men, then you can be baptized in order to have your sins washed away. You can be added to the church. You can be on the road to obtaining that righteousness that is found in Christ Jesus and to understanding and discovering the salvation that comes through the shedding of His blood. He also tells us that after we have put Him on in baptism, if we fall away into sin again, we can confess that sin, repent of that sin, ask for His forgiveness, and we can be restored back to our place in His kingdom once again. So if you're here this morning and you have any spiritual need, if you need to be baptized in order to have your sins washed away, or if you need to repent and ask for forgiveness again as an erring child of God, you have an opportunity to do so today. If you have any spiritual need, once you come, meet me up front and let that need be made known as together we stand and sing our invitation song.